The Mad Max franchise is one of the best in terms of both effectively depicting a survival of the fittest, desolate, apocalyptic landscape and containing some well-shot, choreographed, and thrilling high-octane chase sequences. The series went from the first low-budget movie unexpectedly impressing viewers and gaining international attention to becoming a name brand with financial success with three more movies to follow. Not one of these movies are bad by any sense, but like everyone else, I have ones I like and enjoy more than others. Hey everyone, this is Jan Man, and this is a look back at the Mad Max movies and a personal preference ranking of each. It was caught in developmental hell for years, and it didn't seem like it was ever going to see the light of day. But in 2015, 30 years after the last movie, against all odds, writer and director George Miller brought back his franchise with this reboot of sorts. Miller was nearing 70 at the time of its production, and the man showed he hadn't lost his way or any of his bold artistic merit. In some ways, Mad Max Fury Road is more ambitious than the previous entries. There is more attention to props and makeup, as can be seen on Immortan Joe, whose design is far more wickedly intricate and gnarly than any previous characters. Miller also took liberty with creating some more unique, albeit morosely beautiful landscapes, taking place in a red and blue backlight. Charlize Theron as Furiosa and Hugh Keyes Burns who plays Immortan Joe and also played the villain Toe Cutter in the original film are all very strong in their character portrayals and performances. The chase sequences, particularly the final one, are also well done, both similar to and grander in ways than what came before. That said, it is some of these ambitions by Miller, as cool and admirably creative as many of them are, that take this movie down some notches in comparison to what came before. The original three movies are known for strictly practical effects and stunt work, and there is plenty of each in Fury Road, but there is also plenty of digital or CGI rendering and tinkering, and it's stark in comparison. As beautiful as the movie is to look at, it's also lacking that same grit the others have. The movie also literally speeds up the video times two during most of the action sequences instead of letting them play out naturally like the original movies did, aside from a few scenes here and there. It will go from still, quiet character moments to sped up sequences of action. Why is this necessary for this movie and so many modern movies to do when action movies from years past, including from this franchise, did not and were or are often cited as action movie masterpieces? It's also for my taste jarring not having Mel Gibson, who had become synonymous with the franchise and the Max role, and is what largely gave him the big break into mainstream films and fame. Miller has stated that it was time to turn over the reins for the character, kind of like how different actors play James Bond, but more likely had to do with Gibson's personal choices and struggles at the time. After all, if Miller can write, produce, and direct at near 70, and the similarly aged Burns can come back to star, then Gibson could too on those grounds. Tom Hardy, who takes over the role for Gibson, does as good or well as anyone could have, but it just feels a little off or a little vanilla, and everything that is done in the movie could have worked just as well and more fittingly with Gibson in the lead. Mad Max Fury Road is an artistically gorgeous, creative, ambitious movie with one hell of a bad guy and convincing female lead. It's solid, but just comes shy of fitting the mold of what came before when it could have to make it the best in the franchise. Mad Max is essentially the little movie that could. It was made for very little and as Miller describes it, was cut and edited in his kitchen and living room. It's certainly rough around the edges, most notably in the first half, and a loud blaring score that doesn't always seem to tonally match the events being portrayed. Oh my god, what happened? Oh, hello, man. I just got in myself. Some of the acting isn't award worthy either and the fact that the police all wear tight, black, leather-clad uniforms is interesting. But despite all this, there is something raw and ferocious in its 100% reliability on practical effects and stunt work, which comes across early on. The movie really catches its stride in the second half, when the focus is more on Max and his story, and it becomes more of a revenge film against the gang of bikers. 
Hugh Burns Toe Cutter is pretty captivating as this sick, power-hungry punk, though not quite as mesmerizing as the latter Immortan Joe in Fury Road. It's also easy to see in the fresh-faced Mel Gibson why he'd eventually become an actor viewers would lock on to. The movie's intensity and chase sequences build and ratchet up in the second half, but when the movie ends, it's practically begging for a sequel. It's remarkable how, with so little, Mad Max managed to create some real ingenuity with the way it shoots its chases and points of view to make them more immediate and to feel the risk and danger, something that later movies in the franchise would emulate and other movies to follow in general. Beyond Thunderdome is almost universally near or at the bottom of most fans' list in terms of preferability or likability, but aside from a slow, less interesting middle act with a tribe of kids who plane crashed into the apocalyptic nowhere and naively believe a captain is going to come rescue them, I love every other aspect of this movie. The barter town sequences are very interesting and imaginative, and a place like this could be one which might develop in the apocalyptic world. All these side characters in Barter Town are interesting too. Master Blaster, for example, is an interesting concept of a childlike yet oversized man protecting a mastermind little person. It's also remarkable how the actor who plays Master, Angelo Rosito, is also in well-known movies dating back to the 20s and 30s, such as 1932's Freaks. It would have also been easy to scoff at the casting of Tina Turner in 1985, then known for her singing career and persona, but she's really got a charismatic and enigmatic pull as Auntie Entity. Even other side characters such as the Collector, who does all the bartering, and Auntie Entity's main henchman Ironbar, who has this curious mannequin face on a pole sticking out of his back at all times. The entire Thunderdome sequence is like a more violent pre-1990s UFC octagon and it's well choreographed, shot, and executed. The same goes for the final chase sequence, my second favorite in the franchise, though I've always found it curious why Iron Bar is using this contraption to chase Max and crew, but is nonetheless amusing. As far as follow-ups and sequels go, The Road Warrior aka Mad Max 2 is one of the best of all time. It takes everything about the first one that was good and just made a tight, lean, but full throttle engine of badassery. It sets the scene in black and white telling what had happened to Max in the Australian landscape via wars and violence before bursting into the current day Max, scrounging around for gas like everyone else, alongside his atomic dog. The movie strikes such a perfect tone between humor and brutal or intense violent sequences. Scenes such as Max eating dog food as though it's the best dinner he's ever eaten, or one of Lord Humongous' crazed gang members having his boy toy getting whacked and killed in the head with a boomerang, there's a certain wry humor to it all, yet never underscoring the threat of the gang, Lord Humongous, and the battle Max and crew faces. Lord Humongous is a fascinating character too. It's implied he's involved himself with some kind of atomic energy or something, given how he's clearly deformed or malformed underneath his hockey mask, despite how bodybuilder jacked he is, and his skull has strange rising protrusions from it when he gets forceful or worked up. He's almost like a prototype for Jason Voorhees, a big, strong, monstrous with hockey mask to complete the ensemble. Further, unlike in all the Mad Max films, every character appearing on screen has some level of interest, whether it's the gyrocopter pilot, the feral kid, or the warrior woman. Credit to George Miller for casting females, such as the Virginia Hay character, because she's another in a long list like Tina Turner after her, or Charlize Theron after her, that seem to be neglected when people want to pull out the strong female character card and saying there weren't many of them prior to modern times. The chase sequences, the stunts, the action, they're all the best in the series. Hard to ask for better, more engaging direction on the part of Miller and crew. The movie is damn near perfect or a masterpiece. <laughs> 